Welcome to the Endless Honeymoon Podcast. Hi, it's Moshe Kasher. Hi, it's Natasha Legere, your main host. And it's really great to be here with you. And uh, on our, what episode is this? I don't know, honey. Is this you trying to like um, filibuster right now? Flex. You're trying to flex? Okay, uh-huh. let's hear it. No, I'm just, I'm just letting everyone know I'm the main host. That's fine. But usually, Natasha, before we begin, and maybe it's because you just um, got off stage. Natasha just got off um, at the improv and came in with like kind of one of these I would say slightly like toxic energy of having done well on stage. Like kind of like... You think like when a woman's feeling herself, that's toxic. That's cool. To me, when a woman is confident, it makes... It feels like an attack. Does that make sense? <laughs> mm-hmm. But usually, Natasha, before we begin, you say, oh, what do you want to talk about? And it's funny. You didn't ask that this time. Um, you didn't... We didn't really prep because you came through with um, with that confidence. And I have something. Actually, okay. I've got a big kind of an, uh, an exciting announcement to make. Um, one of our listeners has written into the podcast and requested, nay, nay, demanded that I focus a bit more on surf-related topics. So, Natasha, wait, wait you, hold, hold on, on no, just one a second. listener, one, just a sec. Natasha, you said that you're the main host. I uh, I definitely accede to that and would love it if you take over and just ask me ask me any interview questions you might have about my life as a surfer, about surf culture. Um, how many times have you stood up? How many times have I stood up on a surfboard? Mm-hmm. Like un- more uh, than 10? Unlimited. Aren't you like, how dare you? Aren't you like a bad surfer though? <laughs> okay, first of all... I thought that was your thing. This you is were like, like a very... Like, I know you've never hosted a talk show before. I have. Six episodes canceled almost instantly. But um, <laughs> this isn't the way that you generally interview subjects is by starting off with like a hardcore insult. But I'll take the question. Um, I've stood up many times uh, and I am not a good surfer, but I am. That's what I heard. You heard that? Mm-hmm. From whom? From you and others. Others? Ooh, this r- listener that r- wrote in? No, tell me what the listener said, hun. I don't actually know. I didn't need to hear much. Uh, Laura said somebody wrote in and said they wanted you to talk more about surf topics. And that was all I needed to know. I've been waiting. I've been waiting for such a request. Um, I am a bad surfer. Yes, I did start a bit too late to not have a fear of... I'm Jewish as well, which doesn't help. I think we can all agree. Um and I started a bit too late to not have a, an imminent fear of death every time I go out. I do I do ponder my own mortality a lot of the time. But I've been doing it long enough that I am no longer so bad that I'm incapable of having um, a, an effective and fun time most times that I go surfing. Thank you for that question. It was very insightful. Anything else you'd like to know about my life as uh, a surfer? Surf culture? You know... My equipment? My quiver? Do you know what a quiver is? No. My quiver is... Um, all my different surfboards. So thanks for asking about that. Um, I've got a, I've got an eight ten uh, crime long fish. Uh, it's a hybrid surf, uh, hybrid soft top uh, of uh, epoxy bottom. Can I've I stop you a, for one second? Oh yeah. Did you not want me to keep going through the quiver? No, I think that um, I don't know how to say this. Uh, nobody cares. Actually, for sure, we know God. We what know, what we know a bad 100%. surfer surfs no, with. See, we know one hundred percent that one person cares at least. At least one okay. person cares. Um, do you have any real questions about my um, surf life? You know, are you I curious th- about it at all? Honestly, be sincere. Now. I know this is gonna be hard for you. I do wonder how you do it when it's so uncomfortable out there. Oh, how do I gussy up the uh, motivation? Yeah, it's cold. It's cold. It's wet. Got to throw a, a wet suit on. That's admirable. I'll tell you how I do it, Natasha. And I appreciate you asking. That's a great question. Uh, much more in the line of a real supportive interview question. Um, I do it because it brings me peace of mind. It it is the ultimate experience. It is the only. It's like a novel outdoor experience, which is supposed to be very good for us. What is novel? What do you mean by novel? Like, like it's like unique, and you're rem- you're remembering it, and it's you know it's like when you're outdoors in the elements, experiencing things. I think that's just a better way to be than like. Here's what I like about surfing. Yeah. It's a combination of meditation, physical exercise, fun with friends, communing with nature, and travel. What other, I don't know of another thing that's like, I guess camping. Camping can be like that. Uh, but uh, that is why I, I can motivate myself to do it because when I go surfing 
and have a good day, it puts me in a good mood for the rest of the day. And I got my exercise, and I commune with nature. Sometimes I'll be out there, and there'll be dolphins swimming by. Dolphins right next to me. Dolphins. Just Listen, lurking Moshe, on by. I love when you go surfing. It makes me feel like you've been to a therapist. Mm. And I think it's very healthy for you. I like that you follow your dreams. I like how that you have so many hobbies. I do have a lot of hobbies, huh? It's a little bit too many, but you it, don't have you don't have one. Yeah, I do. It's called motherhood. That's not even close to a hobby. Yeah, well, it doesn't a feel hobby like one. doesn't. Okay, first of all, the definition of hobby is the state doesn't get involved if you're bad at it. <laughs> that's that's kind of classic. That's fair. They don't have the Department of um, uh, Stamp Collection Protective Services. That's fair. You do need a hobby, I think. I Listen, I'm I, good. You're good? I play tennis. I play piano. Piano is, that's close to a hobby. I walk the dog. You walk the dog? <laughs> oh, that reminds me. Are there any other surf-related questions? Um, no, I think I'm good. I wanted to open this up to the community, to the, the honeymooners. Um, Natasha and I... As you know, uh, there's been a saga of death in our family, and we have been t- going back and forth on what kind of dog to get. Uh, I wanted a German Shepherd. Natasha and our child wanted a toy poodle. Mm, named Fufu. Named Fufu. That was not going to do the thing that I want. Oh, Laura really likes that idea because she's got one of these like Instagram dogs. I don't know if you guys know that. You know, like Laura, when I said don't breed or buy when homeless animals die, Laura <laughs> laughed and pointed at her dog and started like nodding like, wait, they're uh teeth over her front lip you know the way people do when they go like fuck yeah like and and she said and then she ripped up a picture of bob barker and said i would never adopt a stray that's what she said she said that that's a quote from her that's pretty fucked up that is fucked up why would she say that she said she doesn't support um shelters and that she does support euthanasia for dogs isn't that Mm. crazy i did not know that well she didn't really say any of that but i then I thought, okay, well, I got to get a dog that can protect our family, right? That's the whole idea here. Because you go for these like woods walks. Honey, I don't want to pick up giant shits, okay? Would you rather Human pick up giant shits, shits or your own spirit after an attack in the woods? Um, I think I'd rather you have a gun. You want me to get a gun rather than get a, a big dog. I mean, have you seen a big dog hunched over to shit it's like really like you feel like you're there's like it's like a human have you seen a gunshot wound (laughs) (laughs) they're worse (laughs) all right okay well anyway i was gonna i wanted to open this up to the community um so i was like no we got to get a big dog i'm thinking rhodesian ridgeback if you don't want a german shepherd i'm thinking um uh you've gotten a lot of german shepherd hate Right, people saying German Shepherd, not a good idea. I was going back and forth. Rottweiler, bad idea. So uh, why don't you tell them we were driving down the street the other day? Oh, right, so finally I came to this one um, that was, a, an. oh, I even thought about getting a silver Labrador because they look kind of like uh, pit bulls, but then I would have to um, peg its ears <laughs> like a pit bull, get it surgically. I wouldn't do that, guys. So then I thought Newfoundland. I found out about the Newfoundland. Do you know about this, Laura? Newfoundlands are, the, are Nana from um, Peter Pan. And they're naturally inclined nanny dogs. They they love children. They'll rescue kids if they're drowning. They're very sweet, um, and, but they are the second biggest dog on earth, and they are 180, 180 pounds they can be. So I was like, okay, we'll do that. That'll be good. And then we saw a man in the street, and I like stopped very suddenly in the middle of the night and said, how do you like your Newfoundland? What did he say? He said, I can't control it. It's knocked me over multiple times, as he said. And I then got this image of Natasha, tiny little petite Natasha, being dragged down multiple blocks of concrete by a a Newfoundland who's seeing a water toy. And so I think we're going to go, here's what I want from the community. Medium, medium large, all right? The size of a pit bull, but not a pit bull. Like kind of like a, all I want is a dog that looks a little intimidating, but is sweet. Right, some, something that when an intruder comes to the door or sees my wife walking through the woods, he sees the dog and he says, nah, I'm going to attack the next person. Okay? So maybe a German Shepherd, Australian Shepherd mix. Maybe a, what do you think, Tosh? I just think it's weird to be really into your dog's race. 
<laughs> it's not it's race like if you're like oh i need a pure bread i need something with an underbite and i need it to be bread and the for three years th- three generations of uh underbites and then can you make sure you bob the tail and then um i need to get it at the glendale galleria all i'm and, saying um, is i want it i just to think be the a- dog whatever comes to you no, just deal with it i want it for a specific reason I want a dog that's intimidating looking, but is sweet and isn't so big that he will cause my wife to lose her nose to a gravel accident. Like, can you imagine if you came home that after walking so the dog sweet. and your whole nose was gone? Like you just had like a Skeletor nose? All right, listen. Well, I used to have a big dog when I was little. I had my paper route and I would take Max with me and I would walk him. Max. He was like a hundred pound chocolate lab and I would roll my papers. And- Problem is with the lab though. Somebody sees a lab, they're like, lab ain't doing shit. I'm going to kill that lab and then I'm going to attack that woman. Mm. I want somebody, I want something with vague ethnic features, you know, like a dog. They're like, what is that? Is that a wolf? So if you know of a dog out there that has those characteristics. That's terrifying and looks hunches over like a human when it takes its big shits in your yard. You never heard the phrase gentle giant, but this is a gentle medium giant. I just want like a BFG, a big friendly giant, like my favorite anti-Semitic children's author, Rod Rahal Dohal. Okay, well, listen, I think that I'm open to a bigger dog. And I'm open to our listeners sending us submissions. Okay, well, let's do it. And uh, I also think we have some people waiting to talk to us, Mesh. Yeah, okay, let's do it. I can't wait to take a call. This is going to be exciting. You're in a good spirit. You look cute tonight. Thanks. You always look cute, but you look particularly sharp to me. Thank you, Ed. <clears throat> you look great, too. Thank you. You match the dog and the couch. I love this little dog. Old Blanche, last man standing over here. But you know the problem with Blanche? Nobody's not going to break into our house for this little girl. They'll be like, I'll take her. I'll ransom her back to the family. You know what Blanche is? What's that? She's a wallflower. Yeah, Blanche is a wallflower. But look at her. She wants a little love. Come on over, Blanche. Be a part of our podcast. Be a part of our love. This gal, this is a good old gal right here. She's sweet. All right, let's let our first caller in. Who are we calling? Okay. Call Emily from Brooklyn. And we got to call her because it's getting late there. Oh, it's late in Brooklyn. Hey, Honeymooners. There is nothing worse than suffering with an uncomfortable bra. Thankfully, Honey Love has revolutionized the bra game. Upgrade from traditional bras that use uncomfortable underwire and bulky fabrics that trap heat. It's not the 90s anymore. We don't have to wear those dumb underwire cup. What was that? They actually made me stop wearing bras. But Honey Love's bras feature supportive bonding that eliminates the need for underwire without sacrificing lift. So you still get the lift, but you don't have to have that outdated wire. Plus, they're made with fabric that is so soft, it feels like a second skin. I truly, these are the only bras I wear now. You'll immediately feel and see the difference. It is so next level comfortable. You'll forget you're wearing it. And they're cute. I have this sheer maroon one. It's really kind of sexy. And it looks like an underwire, but it's not an underwire. I can't talk about these bras highly enough. And for a limited time, get 20% off your entire order with our exclusive link, honeylove.com slash honeymoon. I'm going to go re-up some for fall right now. Support our show and check them out at honeylove.com forward slash honeymoon. Emily, what's up? Hi. Isn't it so late in Brooklyn? I mean, you look like um, a young, wild, wild lady. I am a retired young, wild lady. Okay. Congratulations. (laughs) Hi. How are you guys? Grand. We're good. It's like midnight there, right? It's actually 1 a.m. Oh, shit. Oh, man. Well, thanks for waiting for us. I I usually get to bed late. That's like my sleep schedule recently. Moshe, too. Moshe sleeps till 3 a.m. Or he stays up till 3 a.m. And then... That's um, usually me. I get up at night. We know what your life is like. I've seen girls, dude. I know exactly what you're living through. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have that much money, though. So, (laughs) What's happening? How can we help? Okay. Um, So, I guess... Like the headline question is, how do you date with the attention of trying to find something serious or like a long term partner? And it's like, when and how do I do that without putting pressure on things? And like basically um, in context, I'm 27. I haven't had like a serious relationship since I was like 19. Really, all I know is like short, intense situationships or short flings. I'm a little bit of like a lust junkie. I get bored really quickly or I attract like really intense people and then it like fizzles apart. Mm. You like dudes? 
Yeah, unfortunately, I'm mostly hetero. Unfortunately, yeah, but, um, it's, it's whack being a, a straight white out here. I know it's it's hard for us out here. Um, but yeah, like I don't. I guess I would say like as a lust junkie, I'm like I don't know how to date seriously. What's a lust junkie? Tell me about that. You're just like into the moment of the right before you fuck, and then it's just kind of over. Um, that and like the f- like the lust junkie like. I don't know. I'm like, I'm, I don't even know. Just like lust. Like, it's like basically a lot of the things I've had have never really turned into like real love. Mm. It's like people that I said I love you to, I realized I didn't really mean it. You so didn't mean it? Like, I think so. It was more just like lust. Like, it was like, I just haven't been able to like have a long term thing where it's like, I still like them past the newness, basically. Mm, I know this. Oh, she's speaking my language right here. It's hard. Like, do you guys like also too like I get bored of people quickly or like if there's an initial attraction or spark I'm like eh. Like did you guys have like initial We've been bored with each other for over a decade. I mean Here not- here's the thing. This is why I told Moshe that I could marry him. He doesn't actively annoy the shit out of me. Yeah, this is what she treats a man like who doesn't <laughs> actively annoy the shit out of her. But you know what I mean? Like if sometimes yeah. like there's certain people like like if 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 a guy brags, I'm like I cannot be around this person. Like there are certain things where I'm like, "Oh, this is not for me." But like Moshe was funny, he's helpful, he cares about his family. You know, it's like what are these qualities that are going to not be the th- cuz maybe you're getting sick of them for a reason. Maybe they don't hold these more important qualities that you might need to sustain a real relationship. And have mm-hmm. you? maybe you haven't had a real relationship modeled for you. Did your parents have a good relationship? Please they don't cry. Do? <laughs> and I mean, I guess they do, but it's also like, it's not like a... Lo- they don't have lust for each other that you've witnessed no, personally. They don't no. they don't lust after each other. That's sexy. That's so hard. It, that's what you want out of parents. You want parents that are extremely actively, visibly horny for each other uh, your whole life because then you'll find true love. Like my mom literally said she was like, I don't care if he gets a mistress or not. Oh, that's, uh, she sounds awesome. She sounds like a very cool <laughs> chick. Your mom sounds like a cool chick. Maybe your mom was so like blasé about your dad, it kind of made you... Uh, you know, not able to, I don't know. I got some straight up suggestions for that ass. Okay. Um, it, it's much like my, uh, my political hero, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Mm. Recently recommended. Mom loves him. <laughs> she sounded cooler by the second. Okay. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Anti-vax lunatic. Uh, recently recommended a, a book on a podcast, and I was I was um, I was shaken to say that it was pivotal. This book was pivotal in my transformation from a teenage slut to a grown man ready ready for love. Um, and it's called "The Road Less Traveled" by M. Scott Peck. Have you ever Can't heard of it or read it? People to it's like telling people to read the Bible or Romeo and Juliet. Well, it changed my life. What can you I tell Jack you? Jack Kerouac. Sorry, this is a joke, right? Jack Kerouac, or is this? Like- no, M. Scott Peck. The Road oh. Less Traveled. You're thinking of um, Dharma Bond? Oh, on the road know. again. Sorry. On, 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 yeah, 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 we'll yeah. take that out if that's too embarrassing for you to leave it in the <laughs> podcast. But no, it's it's an old book, but it really it changed the way I look at dating and relationships. Have you ever heard of it? Um, I feel like maybe I have. Well, it's it really changed the way I remember. I was in Australia, I and I was I was truly fucking my way through Australia, Natasha, and I read this book that I think somebody just left there in the in the in the hotel room that I was at, and it talks all about what you're talking about. Is like because I really relate to what you're talking about. It's like what I used to date people, and either I would just it would just be a fuck and that's it kind of situation, or it would be. Um, this really white hot intensity thing that the minute the white hot flash would start to evaporate, I would go, oh, I guess I don't like love this person because that feeling, that euphoric feeling is starting to dissipate. And it, that be, uh, that is what love is. Love is that euphoric feeling, that butterfly feeling. And the minute that would go away, and I would almost have like a, um, 
I'm sure I've talked about this on the podcast before because it's like my, it is my core origin story with love is I would like have like a barometer to see if the, if the butterfly feeling was up or down. And even if it started to go away, I would, it would be like a switch flipped and I'd have to get the fuck out of there. Um, that's not really the way you dated Natasha. Um, I mean, I'm slightly more advanced than you. Like I've always had kind of a boyfriend situation, mm-hmm. Moshe, but I, I do, I do remember like hoping when I was in high school and I had a boyfriend, I had the same boyfriend for like three years. I remember like whenever it would wane, I would pray that I would like, I would just like start hoping that I could feel it again. You know, like it was really important mm-hmm. to me and I would like really like want to have the feeling and be like, how can I get this feeling back? You know, and it comes and it goes, but I mean, if you want to meet your partner and get married so that you can have this undying lust, that's not a thing. Well, that's what <laughs> that's what old M. Scott Peckeroo says. He says that that feeling of of euphoria, he describes it as lust. So it's interesting that you're describing it as lust too, because to me, I thought lust. I thought lust is just being horny, but like that feeling of like drug, like like th- this person is drug, and I need to like. That's what. I, yeah, it's like. I felt that so intensely for people where I really thought it was love. And more recently, it's like they it was like also too recently I got love bomb. Like every single like time I think I'm like starting to get serious with someone, I realized it was like all just like love bombing. Cause again, like we were both just like in just an intense thing. Um so that's yeah, wait, can I just say something really quick? This is another thing to look out for. Like when I was young, falling in love, like there weren't people on the internet naming everything. I know. <laughs> That's true. You know what I mean? Like you got to kind of be careful with that because it's like, oh, this, and there's a meme about it and this is that. And then it's like, you know, it's like, you just have to kind of exist. The infographics. You got to exist yeah. a little bit. You're not old. I mean, just to put it in perspective for you, like I met Moshe when I was 38, but like I started comedy when I was 27. So it's like, you know, like that I was, you know, like your career and in, in your life and your love life. It's like th- there is not this is not a race. Right. I mean, maybe it is because the world's ending and everyone's going to get those marks. To be honest, that's kind of how I feel, too, because I'm like, I want to be able to have like a family and like in my career, but also just like experience this thing before the world. Does so end. I think that's I think that was re- that's really wise, Natasha, that sometimes the in their internetification, uh, the internetification of everything has made you made us even more analytical, about- more aware of like every moment and mm-hmm. every oh, he's doing this. And then, oh, you're you, they did that. And you're busy analyzing things rather than experiencing them. And that's kind of what I was doing with my dating it was like I was analyzing the level to which that person made me feel high by being around them or being in communication with them. So in that book, it kind of describes like that isn't love. We think we, we we make this mistake of thinking that that's what love is because that is the most um, that is the feeling that comes at the beginning of a loving relationship that feels so intense. It feels so good. It is a lot like drugs. And his point is, love is the thing that happens after that or doesn't. So so love is has nothing to do with love. Is picking up his socks. Well, it really is. Love is is not about how it makes you feel and it's about actually how you feel about that person it's not about how that person makes you feel it's about how you feel about that person no it's also about how the person makes you feel because you need someone who makes you feel confident and secure right. and right but all but that but then how do i even get there like well, you know what i mean like i i for me for me natasha seems to uh, not not share this feeling as much for me it was about um st- stopping chasing that drug and starting to chase after someone that I that I cared about. I mean, he describes it as like love is actually caring about another person's spiritual, physical, and emotional well-being. He says more than your own, but it was written in the fifties, uh, so I just translated it. Just that is the part that's love. Is like how do you feel about that person? How do you want to serve that person? And as RFK said in his raspy little anti-vax voice, love is an is an action, and it's an action of courage right? Like for me, I don't know about for you, for me, wanting that feeling only and leaving when it disappeared was because I was terrified. I was scared of having to be in a relationship that wasn't like day to day, like fireworks exciting and be around for what an actual relationship felt like, which is some mundane stuff and some really beautiful stuff, but some like stuff that was like 
challenging because it wasn't it wasn't exciting 24 hours a day i wanted it to feel like a drug and in fact what it was it was much more like food it was uh nutrient uh, additive and and healthy and felt good and healthy so that is what i um my paradigm shifted and then when natasha and i started dating when i would start to panic when i would feel any kind of waning feeling in the very beginning of our relationship i would just say this isn't real this isn't this isn't reality. You're just panicking and freaking out. Hang in there. How do you actually feel about that person? And then I would say, oh, I really like her. I'll stick around for another day. And then oh, now we're 10 years married. It's been a, been a, quite a ride. So do I still like, because like I'm currently not really seeing anyone right now and I'm not really doing online dating. I'm kind of just like focusing my own stuff. And then if people come up, whatever, if it happens, it happens. But it's like, like how do I date slow? How do you <laughs> but how, like still keep things exciting? I guess or how, like how I don't want to. Or how, actually, actually, like how do I express that I do want something serious, but without putting pressure on things? You know what I mean? Like how quickly do you bong? So usually I try not to, but sometimes it's the first time. I'm first date. First date. I'm a retired slut. I'm no, trying. there's I'm nothing. I got no judgment about quick bongs. Uh, but but it usually doesn't go anywhere. But the problem with a quick bong for me is not that you're a slut and that that's bad. Because oh, no, if, I, I take slut as like a crown. No, like, but I know I'm saying I'm saying exactly that. If you're like I'm horny, I want to fuck some dude. I more power to you. But if you're like, here's my situation. I, I have no opinion on how long someone should wait. But I do have an opinion on how long like you should wait because I relate so much to the way that you date. It's like it, you should go slowly, not because like you're fucking it up by going too quickly but because you're you're so confused in that in that early phase about whether you like a person or not and then you go to the the bong phase and then it just like swirls that confusion even more for you it feels like you should be waiting a little bit longer not because of some external ethical value but so that you can figure out how you feel about a person before you get get in intimate with them like yeah, you know well, like that idea like if you want to like be in a relationship you, you have to become the person you want to be in a relationship with right that makes sense yeah and i would also say like maybe as um a fun little activity just be a little more selective i have been more for sure like recently. my friend you know, told like, me today that she like a guy asked her out on a date to play foosball and she's <laughs> like and i don't know why but i decided to say no i'm like yeah that sounds like fucking hell <laughs> Like, what do you think the next date's going to be? Like, you know, it's just like, be yeah. kind, you know, it's like, you don't need to fall in love at all costs. Like you want mm. to fall in love with someone you have something in common with and who feels like they could be a good partner and who like has these qualities that you really like and you need to assess what those qualities are. And, you know, I, I think that it's, it's not just like blindly like, oh, I need to find someone who I'm going to be obsessed with. Can I tell you what's a huge turnoff for me? It's sure. It's a date with a woman that's like, just so you know, I'm in this for a long term serious thing. That's what I'm after. Because I'm like, do you want kids? Like, I'm just how many kids do you want? Well, no, I obviously want to do that, but I'm just like, but like, when do I? But I'm just saying, no, no, no. What I'm saying is, like, to me, when the person said, I've had people say that to me on a date, what I'm hearing in that moment is not, oh, this is a person that really wants something serious. It's, oh, this is a person that's in an extreme defensive pose. Uh, that's like yeah. actually acting out her disappointment with other men that she's dated verbally on our first date. She doesn't, she's not ready for anything. I'm a, I don't want anything to do with this person. Uh, like Natasha yeah. didn't say that to me. She wasn't like, just so you know, this is serious. Actually, she said the opposite. She was just trying to fuck, I think actually, right, Natasha? I don't remember. Well, that is kind of what happened. But anyway, it's just like, if I want to be in a serious relationship then I will just act in a way that will that will garner that, right? It's not. I will never announce that I'm here for a serious relationship. I don't think ever is my point. One thing, I never do it. I never. So then I just like hope that, like I never even say it because I'm like, in a way, it's like I'm trying to always act like a tough person where it's like I don't want it. Yeah, Brooklyn. So, <laughs> cool. Well, it's hard out here. No, okay. it's not. I feel like the easiest place to meet people would probably be Bur Brooklyn. You think so? Because you're you everyone's be going out. There's tons of street life. You could just like walk outside your door and walk into a bar. And no, meet but your it's like that. Mate. Andrew Michonne. Well, a lot of them are the same, though. They're all these like fucking e boys, man. Right. No, What's but an e boy. You, you actually coined the term on like another oh. e fuck boy. Sorry, <laughs> e fuck boy. 
<laughs> yeah, it's like it's like that Andrew Mashon joke. He's got this joke. He goes, I just completed the LA guys triathlon. I skated for two hours, surfed for two hours, and told ten women I wasn't interested in anything serious. Like I get it. It's like you you the the pool is not broadcasting what what you want. There is a lot, but it's also Okay, here's what you need to do. You need to brainwash yourself in this way. You have ten years. Give yourself ten years. When you're on this date. Thirty seven? Yeah, oh, just just no. I mean, you could still have kids. Like, just give yourself, say, I'm gonna give myself ten years to find the person I want. Like the the idea that like that's too much pressure to put on yourself. That's too much pressure to put on every date. Like, if you just know inside, like that by thirty seven, if you don't meet the person you want, then you'll figure out another, you know, you'll pivot and maybe freeze your eggs or whatever. But you you've got plenty of time. I and, and by the way, I wanna does everyone around me has relationships. I'm like literally always the only single friend. So in a way, I guess that's like also why I feel pressure. compare and despair, sister. I mean, those people aren't you're you don't want to date the people they're dating, do you? You want the rest no. of their lives? Isn't that what you always say? Anytime you compare no. yourself, isn't that your quote, Tosh? I thought that was an AA quote. No, I need well, compare and despair is an AA quote, but you always say like anytime you compare yourself to someone else, then you have to take on all the other parts of their life too. Well, friend Lebowitz said that, which I thought was a really good quote which is like I she's like I never understood why people were jealous of other people because like then if you really want their life you have to have all of their life right do you really yeah, want true. all of their life no because half their life you think is fucked up <laughs> no, no, I, I love my life for the most part it's just like this one thing that I just I just here here's the thing you have to be easy on yourself and mm. give yourself a break and be selective and, you know, it's, and go to things and try to meet people who are going to be interested. I mean, I give the same advice all the time. No, but I think that it's good. No, advice. no, it's, it's, no, it's valid. It, the, here's the thing. Well, I'm not saying, but I'm not saying never tell a person I want to be in a relationship. I'm saying don't ever have the conversation where you say, here's what I'm after. A long term serious thing. Like if you're dating someone and you know this is whack, it's not going to work out. Unless you want to use that person for sex, then you you just don't you just don't sleep with that person, or you do and just hope that you that eventually you'll be able to notice. Because I'll be honest with you, I was not I did not stop sleeping around until I started dating Natasha. So it's not like I was like became serious once I read that book, but I had a paradigm shift, which was I really recommend that you read the book. I had a paradigm yeah. shift that was like what I'm after, what I've been after is a drug, and what I'm after is something different. I understood that. Like, I've got these two relationship paradigms in my life. Uh, my mom and my dad and my mom and my stepdad. My mom and my dad, they met. Two weeks later, my mom moved in with him. They had an abusive, horrible, fucked up relationship that lasted for seven years. And then he, uh, she left him and stole us away in the night. And they never talked again. And they hated each other for the rest of their lives. Oh, that's like my parents' relationship too. That's so cute. But then there's my mom and my stepdad's relationship. When my mom first met my stepdad, she wasn't attracted to him. He asked her out. She was like, oh, you're a nerd. I'm not down. What, Whatever. And then slowly like... To she her credit, he was taking ASL sign language classes to meet a deaf woman. <laughs> so anyway, I don't know if it was to me a deaf woman, but he was doing that. And then then she went out with him and then she's like, oh, this guy's kind of interesting. Oh, I kind of like him. And then they started dating and then slow. Now they've been married for, you know, 30 years or something like that. And they've got this great calm. And they hate as, each, each other just as much as every other couple. They don't hate each other at all. They love each other. My mom and stepdad. So what I'm saying is it never burned white hot. For them. Those are extreme examples. Mm -hmm. you're, you don't want really either of those, right? You don't want like yeah. one where you're like, I don't even know if I'm attracted to this guy. And then, um, and then, oh yeah, no, he's beautiful. I get it. A slow. And you also don't want like, oh, I, I'm attracted to this guy so much. I'm willing to put my physical safety on the line. You want something though that is less the drug chase and more the healthy thing and so you got to attune yourself to to noticing those signals by sh having a, i think a paradigm shift i think reading this book would really help i think That's you should think. read the road less traveled because moshe really think i mean i remember reading that book and having it was the first self-help book i ever read and i remember thinking like i had never thought about a lot of the stuff it said but i was also like 18 um and i also think you should watch some betty davis movies and just try to get some game you know She's just do game, an impression too much game. Huh? But yeah, I have too much game. It's just like the the game doesn't continue. Then it ain't game, honey. Oh, get okay. some of that game that you know you want to like. You want to reel it in. You want to get to the finish line. You want to get those people interested. You know, sometimes. 
I'm just saying, I'm not suggesting don't sleep with guys quickly. I'm just saying for me. I'm not saying that either. I'm saying, I know you're not. I'm saying for well, me. Well, now I'm like, I'm bored of having sex with people I don't know. So uh, that's kind of also where I'm like. Well, I always would. What would happen for me is I would almost convince, I would be so attracted to a woman that I would almost convince myself, like, maybe I do kind of like this person. And then I'd sleep with them and I'd go, oh, no, I don't. But if I had dated that woman for three more weeks, without having sex with I probably could have figured that out. So I never did that. So it's hard for me to give you that advice. But uh, but I think that could help you figure out, like, if you're, you know, it's like this AA guy, Lord, in San Francisco used to say, he's like, are, are you my girlfriend? No, if not, get the fuck out of my way. It's almost like you want these guys that aren't your boyfriend to get the fuck out of your way so that you can find the person that is. Well, listen, good luck to you. I still don't Thank you. even exactly know what your question was or if I we helped you. I understand the question okay, exactly. It, I literally lived through this. And you know what I did? It, it, it's a, a rocky road. I know we got to go. It's a rocky road. After I read that book, The Road Less, I hope you don't get jealous right now. But after I wrote, read that book, The Road Less Traveled, I immediately, I, got, I thought, I know who it is that I have felt this way about. And it's this person for whom I had a white hot thing and then it went away and I broke her heart by breaking it off with her. I was like, oh, I got to go out of here. And I always regretted doing that. And I was like, that's a person for whom I have this like love and care. I really love and care about this person. So I contacted her. And I said, you know, I read this book and I had this big revelation and I really feel like we should give this a go. And she was like, go fuck yourself. You hurt me. And I was like, okay, that's not at all what I expected to happen in this situation. And then two, three, four years later, I met Natasha and I was already in the mindset of understanding a little bit more about myself that I was ready for that relationship. So it's, it's not an instant fix, but it was about having a mental shift for me that was that was the big thing and i would get out of your comfort zone a little bit how so i don't know if i were in your position i was like i really want to meet someone soon because you know there is an apocalypse apocalypse coming mm -hmm. you know just like maybe ask a guy out maybe i, I don't know maybe just, get back. i mean here's the good thing about the apps you can put in the apps i'm looking for something serious and then it's like no one that contacts you will not will be looking for anything else well maybe you know what i mean but that is the yeah. advantage of the apps is that so much information is displayed up front but you don't want to get on them so what you have to do is just find somebody that makes you feel like not just excited and high but like you care about them so all right okay we well go. good luck to you say thank you love you guys you're awesome You've been a big comfort to me for this whole time you've existed. So thank you. Aww. We'll see you in Brooklyn when we come. We'll be at the Bell House sometime soon, I think. I, I did see you at the Bell House, like, I think a year ago. That was a fun show. That was a fun well, show. Well, he's so, coming back. Yeah, I'll be back. All right. I'll come well, back I, for my I, book. Natasha, you should come. I want yeah. to see you live. You should yeah, come. Maybe. She hasn't come the entire time we've been together. I have a family <laughs> now. All right. Well, good luck out there. It's All right, hard out there so for much. a pimp. Goodbye. Bye. I got it. I get what she's going through. I, I mean, I literally. Li you just like, say you understand everybody because. No, that is what I was doing. Want to okay? What do you think I want? What? You want to regale all of your old old loves. You want me? To, you mean I want to tell stories about how <laughs> what a slut I was? No. I mean, I related to that girl so much. I just feel like I was in her position. Twenty seven is so young. It's not as young as you think it is. Is it? Is it not as young as it used to be? No, it's the same age it's always been. You don't think twenty seven is young? I think it's young-ish, but I don't think it's like weird to be thinking about like settling down into a more mature relationship at 27. Okay, well, my mom got married at 23, which is like how a lot of moms got married. And I just feel like that ruined their life. Yeah, but she was getting married at 23. This woman's thinking about shifting from being like a wild cocaine sniffing Brooklyn party girl to like going into something more serious at 27. So it's different. Right. Okay. She ain't going to get married next week. Right. I hear you. Do you agree with me? Yeah. Do you love me? Yeah. On what level? Uh, high level. That's awesome. Natasha, that was a great call, but I would love to hear a couple secrets. Yeah, let's do a few. Hi. Um, my secret is that a while ago, me and my boyfriend got drunk and he accidentally sent me to the ER. Told me I had lots of expensive tests and... It was whatever. I felt he felt bad. I felt bad. But, you know, I have insurance. But then about a month after, I got a $7,200 bill. And I was freaking out. And he obviously felt really bad because it was his fault. And so he sent me um, almost all of it, pretty much within a day or two. And I 
paid it off and it was great. And then it turns out I never billed my insurance. So it was really only like twelve hundred dollars. So I was like about six thousand, I don't know, I'm not gonna get math. And then I'm keeping it. Because when we first started dating, he was kind of a loser and he didn't have a job and I not telling him and I felt bad, but actually not at all. So bye. Love you guys. Wait, I want more details. Why well, did she yeah. go to the ER? The disrespect to call a secrets hotline talking about my husband sent me, me to the ER and then not tell us why. I mean, it's just like, what do you think this is? It's a secrets hotline. I mean, how dare you? I've never been angry at a caller before. I'm angry now. And so she's stealing money. I think it's her boyfriend. That's the thing. She stole seventy sixty eight hundred dollars from her boyfriend. What 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 kind of ethics do I expect from her on the secrets hotline? You know, if she's willing to steal 7200 she's willing to steal my curiosity as well. And to be honest, he doesn't sound like that much of a loser to get you $7,200 in two days yeah. because it was his fault. I mean, unless he like hit He's you across the face or something. Right. What did happen? We is just what, need more information. Yeah. Did he do a $6,800 um, sin? Right. Grievous enough to, to warrant this, this theft. If not, I mean, if he just like accidentally tripped you and then you broke your nose... And also the fact that it took him two installments to pay you back in full, even though it was in two days, it means that he didn't have that much money. So he doesn't really sound like a loser to me. It sounds like, well, I get what you're saying, but it does and seem he, like he's really trying to please you. And if he was a loser that's unemployed, why are you taking his money? The motherfucker needs money. I don't know about this one, you guys. I, I don't know. This I just I just don't know. Well, listen, um, I don't. They did not sound together anymore. Uh huh. And. Uh, Listen, we just in order to do a, a judgment, we would definitely need more information. Yeah, call us back. Tell us why you went to the ER. All right, let's do another secret. I'm super nervous to leave this, but I'm going to do it. Um, my secret is that a number of years ago, these two friends of mine were like flirting with me at this party, and I didn't realize that they were hooking up and, and if it was serious, but it kind of escalated and it turned into this threesome. But the guy got super nervous and he couldn't get hard. So the whole threesome was just sort of a failure. And then he was really embarrassed and like begging for this redo. Um, so he offered to pay us each a thousand dollars if we would do it again. And we agreed because I was a broke college student, but without the like natural organic energy of the night turning into a threesome, it just felt really, really awkward and staged. So I started doing shots of tequila, and I never do shots. And he got us this really fancy hotel suite. And right when the threesome started, I threw up in the bed. Ugh. But I was so drunk that I didn't even know I threw up. And so I woke up alone with like a thousand dollars in cash on the nightstand next to me, and just like a pile or puddle, I don't know, of puke. And then I felt really like bad taking the money because I like to work for my money, and I just felt guilty. So then I called them at like five in the morning to finish the job and they were still together. So I drove to meet them and brush my teeth and then finished the threesome. And then I felt better about taking the money. But then I guess we decided it was really fun and we wanted to have another threesome. And then this time we didn't get paid. And then this time the other girl got super drunk and then she threw up. Um, and then I found out that the guy was actually married the whole time. But to be honest, I think by the time it was the third threesome, I already knew that. But I kind of just wanted to do it because it was fun and because he took us for a fancy dinner. Okay, that's it. Bye. This was like... Um, so this man's like feeding them and they're like vomiting while they're <laughs> fucking him. <laughs> this read like that... Um, What was that movie that Janix had directed? Zola? Mm. Is that what it was called? This was like, this was like Zola. This is like a Paul Thomas Anderson movie. I mean, there's a lot of ups and downs going on here. Organic threesomes, natural threesomes, uh, paid through prostitution, vomit. How many other threesomes vomit. are people drunk? Do you how many, how often? Probably like seventy percent. Yeah, that's a really good guess. Seventy. But I I feel this guy's pain. I've been in a threesome where I couldn't I couldn't uh, answer the bell. It's difficult out there. It's it's hard. It's in, intimidating. Two oh, women? you can't get it up. Yeah, and I was so sober, sober as a judge. And you couldn't get it up. Couldn't get it up. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Tried to throw. I tried to throw a thousand dollars at my own erection. Nothing. <laughs> I told you about the one. I must have told you about the one. There was one time that there were two group sex situations where I couldn't get an erection. But one time, I'm sure I've told this story before. But one time, 
it was me and a girl I was dating and another couple. And I couldn't get an erection with his girl, but he definitely could get an erection with mine. So he's like next to me pounding away. And I'm just like, oh, this doesn't usually happen to me to this disappointed stranger. Yeah. But then are you supposed to start kissing the guy? No. You guys are just like, let's swap partners. Yeah. Um, Yeah. In front of each other. That's right. That sounds really immature. How old were you? Immature? <laughs> yeah. That's the word you use for it? Immature? <laughs> it's it's just, actually pretty mature content. Oh, so like, I'm going to fuck your girlfriend and then let's switch. Im- immature is not the word. I don't know. Uh, it, well, I don't know what. Ch- I don't know. It feels like... Um, A young man's game? I guess. I guess. But anyway, he was older than me. He was balding. I remember that. And he was just pounding my girl. And I was just like, I can't. I wish I. And when you say your girl, like how many dates had you been on with this girl? I knew her pretty girl? well. You knew her well. Oh, yeah. But she was not your girlfriend. So I was somebody I was dating. Okay. Yeah. But it was definitely somebody I was comfortable enough and I've been dating long enough to say, would you be interested in answering an ad on a random sex? Oh, this was your platform? idea? I think I pitched it, yeah. Oh, that's very romantic. <laughs> I didn't say it was romantic. So I wouldn't one use of the your, word immature or romantic. So one of your approaches with this girl was to like, hey, do you mind if we answer this Craigslist well, she ad was together? Moshe. I know. She, well, she was something. This is really sad. I know. She was something. Is that a good word that you agree with? <laughs> no, she was something that's going to kind of blow your mind. I mean, it's kind of like you're just not going to relate. She was. Open-minded? Sexually adventurous. Yeah. Mm. So that was kind of her thing. So she was down. She was kind of excited about the idea. Cool. Yeah. But in the end, she didn't really love the guy. And I didn't have a good experience either. I would No, say, it sounds really fun to get railed by a bald guy <laughs> while you're guy you barely know is on the other side of the bed well. fucking someone else i, I guess well. you know what here's the thing you said 70 percent are drunk i would mm-hmm. say 70 percent are awkward too ah uh, i see i would say the the amount of times that you're both sober and it's super erotic is probably in the 20 percent zone mm. but it can happen i've Hello. had it i've had it happen once should we take another call yeah but before we do my favorite spots to surf are i go to sunset in LA, which is, you know, I know people are rolling their eyes, but when I go to Topanga, I had a good time at Topanga the other day, but when I go to Topanga, there's often many like sort of middle-aged guys that are living out there, living out their uh, teenage alpha fantasies in the lineup up there. And I don't like going to Malibu First Point or any of those places because it's too crowded. But my secret spots are the spots that I surf north of Ventura. And I'm not going to tell you exactly where they are, but that's where I like to go. I like to go up into the 805 and find a little bit more uh, room to grow. Mm. A little bit more elbow room. Some of the beautiful coastal Riviera-like crispy waves of my golden country. All right. Well, uh, let's. speaking of golden, let's call Shane... In the golden state of Utah. No, California's the golden state. <laughs> what is the Utah? Isn't Utah kind of like got like sand that's gold? It does have sand. It's, it's golden. It has beautiful colors. What is the state motto of Utah? It's the what state? Beehive state. It's the beehive state, which is what goes in, comes out of beehives? Honey. And that honey is the color of? Piss. <laughs> that's right. It's the piss honey state. Hi, Shane. Hi. How you doing? Good. I'm well. How are you? What is that strong sign behind you? That is a strong sign. That's that's a. I'm actually in a hotel in Austin, Texas. That's uh. This is it. Uh-huh. Oh, that's a hotel. Okay. I was gonna say if that was behind you, just in your normal day, I would say maybe we should hang up on you. But Shane, we were just talking about Utah and how you're from Utah. Yes. How my family. Uh, we're one of the original founders of the state of Utah. They're oh, in, really? Yeah, they're are, in, you a, are you a Young or a, a Smith, maybe? No, no, I'm, we're not that. Um, we were probably like the cooks. We were probably like the potato peelers. The No, he oh. means like bring them young. Yeah, no, I know. I'm oh. saying we weren't in the upper echelon of Utah society. I'm sure we, we just fixed the wagon wheels or something. Oh, cute, hon. All right, Shane. How can we help? Well, thanks for talking to me tonight. I, I'm excited to see Natasha in December at Wise Guys. Ooh. Wait, hold on. I am not coming there. <laughs> you, it seems like you are. To Utah? Yeah, December 2nd. I I have tickets. <laughs> I really hope you are. Wait, are you serious? Because that's not on I'm my serious. schedule. Oh, Shane. Man, maybe yeah. you can give us some advice on how to keep a better schedule. December 2nd? Yes, I really think it's December 2nd. Well, Damn it. I forgot to include that on my schedule. 
I don't want to bring up anything awkward, but I'm seeing Duncan Trussell there, uh, November. How or something. dare you? How and dare you? I'm sorry. That is I'm so just, disrespectful no, to even mention okay. it. All the way. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I love Duncan, November, but I you married love Moshe. Him? You love him? You know, I think he's a great guy. You got mad love for him? I got mad love for him, but I got more mad love for you. Thanks, dear. I, my love for you is madder. I appreciate that very much. Shane, thank you for bringing um, uh, both jealousy and schedule panic into our <laughs> evening. How can we help you? <laughs> uh, thanks for talking to me tonight. I um, I have been seeing a woman. Her name is Shannon. Okay. Uh, for about two years. And I, I'm divorced. And I was uh, I was a member of the Mormon church for, for some time. So I have four daughters. Mm. And uh, we have had some challenges. And she has one daughter. She's never been married and has never been, never been Mormon. But we have had some challenges in m- merging our, our families. And that's, that's kind of the issue is uh, when we go on vacations or other places, uh, my daughters say, you know, I, I really like Shannon. She's really wonderful. But they say they don't like me when I'm around Shannon. Um, what? They think, yeah, they think I act kind of um, I think I think Shannon would believe that I have fostered more of a friendship with my daughter since I got divorced, and and um, because I spent a lot of my time uh, in my life being being uh, being Mormon, me and my daughters, my daughters are in their early twenties or late teens, and we're kind of going through some similar things where we're having maybe some similar experiences. Where um, we we go, we go to concerts together, we drink together. I went to uh, the the uh, Utah version of the burning man it was called element 11 i went to that uh, Mosho, how'd evening. you miss that i mean shane didn't invite me he was probably off with duncan <laughs> i'm team Mosho all the way 100 <laughs> percent. do you have tickets to see duncan yeah he does i do he does he told me he told us that all right yeah. go, so go ahead anyway so um we just had a little real hard time like meshing our meshing our lives together with my daughters and and uh, again shane Shannon thinks that I've created this friendship with my daughters. That's more of like a, a friendship than a than a father daughter relationship, and she thinks that's that's kind of getting in the way. So I guess the one thing I'm wondering is is there you know something I can do to have a better uh, to better to better uh, merge that merge that family together? With we have five da- daughters together, my four and her one, and then. I guess I wondered if you, you two seem like, you know, you've got a daughter together. You're, you've got, I think you've got a really good perspective on, on what that, what it takes to be in a relationship. And is, is there a priority list where I, should I, I, I felt very strongly that I should really prioritize my partner above. I don't want to make it a competition with my daughters, but I feel like that person, if I'm, if I'm really making a life with her, if she's my, if she's my person, I really should be. You're basically like, which side do I choose? Because like, they're like, we love her, but we don't like you when you're around her and they're all ganging up on you. And she's like, well, you're not really doing a good job of like having boundaries because they're your kids, not your friends. But the thing is, it's like, you're trying to please them all. And what about you? You know, like celebrate the love. Yeah, it can be awkward. It can be goofy, you know, like unless you're like becoming, you know, this abhorrent person when you're around. I mean, it just feels like they're just, like super judging you, right? Like your daughters, like you're not, it's not like you're becoming a bad person when you're around Shannon. I think maybe I am a little bit more of a dad when Shannon's around. So I'm like, guys, you know, don't be, don't be crazy. Don't be, you know, but when, when she's not around, I'm like, yeah, let's go crazy. Let's do all these fun things. Let's, uh-huh. let's, let's drink together. Let's go to concerts together. And with is, Shannon, is the, is like, the drinking, is Shannon mad that you're drinking with your kids or do, hanging out with them in that way? No, but she just thinks it's kind of strange that I'm being being such a friend to them. Mm. And, and do you and does it feel weird to you? I mean, I maybe I'm a little overcompensating a little bit because we got divorced and I'm trying to be you know Disneyland dad where I'm like, hey guys, come on in, let's let's but they're do some 20. Fun things. And, yeah, they are early. I 20s remember and, my dad taking me to New Orleans and being like, Want a cigarette kid? Yeah. Like he wanted me to like smoke and drink. But and- you you always say he was like a bad dad. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, he just thought it was so cool that we would like but be be at Pat O'Brien's, like the just, worst place in just, New Orleans. It's just funny advice to be giving this guy because you're you're refrained about your dad. No. Like, he had no idea how to be a fucking father. No, but, but you I, know. I mean, I, it, but I, I'd always I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm 
spitballing here, but it did always strike me as a little desperate, you know, when he was like, have a cigarette, but yeah. whatever. I, I, it's beside the point. I, I think it's like important how you feel. I and mean, what do you think, Moshe? Well, I just I, feel like he's kind of getting ganged up on. And what I would do is just kind of like slough it all off, you know, and just be like, ha ha. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, let's try, let's all have dinner. Just keep suggesting things, you know, try to, and make her your priority in your mind, Shannon, but still like be super loving to your kids and try to include everybody and maybe create more environments for you all to hang out. That would be fun for everybody that, you know, they would all like, if there's a movie coming up, try to include the girls, try to, you know, try to make more things, almost do the opposite. Like they're saying like, Oh, you, we don't like, don't, don't ask them. Like the worst thing you could do is come up to your four daughters and be like, was that a little better? Yeah, you're so right. And you know he's doing that. Yeah. I mean, you're right. the only don't thing- do that. Don't- it's don't don't ask them how you're doing. Don't ask them if they like her. Just keep like come. You're a fun guy. Even though you're a born Mormon, you know, it's like you're just like doing your thing. Like come up with fun things. Come up with more vacations, more dinners, more p- family movie night, whatever it is, and just include them. And it'll all two years is not that long. And they have your mom or your ex-wife, their mom yeah. talking shit about Shannon all day long from the side glances, even though she says she's not and she says she's happy for you. So you've got like so much going against you. You're never going to win this. So all yeah. you can do is just try to like create this new weird kind of family and have fun and just, I don't know. What do you think, Mosh? I think that the, everything you said was very wise accept the recommendation to go see a movie because clearly this guy's a burner he doesn't want to go to a fucking movie i'm just if saying there's a if, cool if, dubstep if, if, if there's a cool dubstep or a bass dj in town that's who you got you're gonna want to but i think your motto here's your motto shane this is your new motto i'm do i'm doing my best that's what you say to everybody in that's your what, head and out loud that's what you say to everybody it was Shannon's like, I don't know. You're not really being much of a dad figure, more of a of a of a pal to them. And you go, Oh, Shannon, I know. I'm doing my best. Yeah. And they go, Dad, you're being a fucking total fucking cop all of a sudden. Now, weren't we just t- dropping Molly together at Utah Burn? <laughs> and you go, You go, Well, I'm I'm doing my no best. Idea how close you are? <laughs> you could you just go. I'm doing my best. I'm doing my best. Yep. Here's the thing. Like the okay. All of this is like, and maybe dial it back a little bit with the kids. I don't know. That's up to that's up to Shane. You do what you want. I my thing is your your kids are they are not kids, but they are not adults yet, and so probably some of this like compl- part of the complaint is a grave that you've dug for sure. Is that you've been partying with them for two years, and now you're like all of a sudden Shannon's around, so you're like, oh kids, uh, <laughs> kids, well you you know it's ten p.m. It's about time for bed, and they're like, uh, dad, you know. Like we just went to Utah burn or whatever, you know, like, so, so, so I think part of it is that, is that they're like, you know, why are you being like all of a sudden trying to be like dad, dad, when we've been like had party dad for, uh, and then, and part of it is, but part of it is there is my guess, even though uh, I don't know much about melding a family or having adult daughters. Part of it is they're expressing their frustration with you and the relationship and the divorce, even though they like Shannon, even though they love you, they still have all these probably unresolved feelings about the fact that their world imploded a little bit. And they like you as fun dad, but they also want you as real dad. And they like Shannon, but they also wish it was your mom and that nothing had changed. And so they're expressing this um, frustration about what you're like around Shannon. But really, it's like a it's a, actually a frustration about like what their life is now. And so you yeah. just go, guys, I know. I love Shannon. Sometimes, you know, I think I'm too too much of a party dad with you. And when Shannon's around, I, I want to act one way. And and then you say to Shannon, Shannon, I know. Sometimes I think I'm too much of a party dad, but then you're around and I want to like impress you, but I really also want to make sure that I have this great relationship with my with my daughters. I'm just doing my best. Like I think doing my best. I'm doing my best and be honest with everybody. I th- I think saying out loud to your daughters, like, you know, it I'm sure it's confusing. Because sometimes we're partying and then when I'm around Shannon, I'm like acting a little bit more like your dad. And, you know, I'm just doing my best. I'm trying to I'm trying to make Shannon happy and make you happy because you guys are, are I would never say the thing about putting Shannon first. <laughs> I just don't think there's any use in that. And also, yeah. I, I think like, you know, putting just in, in just always putting in perspective what the positive you know, being grateful for things like I just hearing you talk about this. I'm realizing like when we get old, Moshe, our child will have no siblings. 
you know, and that's like, that's going to be the hard time. Like right now it's fun and easy and we can always do play dates with people and go on vacations with friends, with kids. But like when we're dying and when we're old, like she's not going to have anyone. Like the fact that your daughters have like four siblings that you've given them and they have all of this, like, you know, they, yeah. they, yeah, like yeah. I, I, they're, they're so lucky that, I mean, to have like four people to process your parents with or three people, that's huge. Like, I mean, and, and I think like I was thinking while you were talking, you say, do I'm doing my best. And then the other big prop thing for you, the challenge for you, Shane, is stop trying to affect the merging of your families. You yeah. don't have the ability you to do that. It. Yeah, you can't do it. Look, you've been trying and you can't do I it. Have. You 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 cannot make them merge with harmony. All you can do is be like the best father and the best partner you can you can be and see what they decide to do. Yeah, like, don't pay for them to go places to get them to like you. Well, just like it's not it's not going to happen the way that you want it to happen. It's going to happen the way that they want it to happen because there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people involved in this family. And you, you're you like, well, what am I doing wrong that they all seven people aren't living in harmony? You're not that powerful that you could be the linchpin to make them all happy and, 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 and meld. Here's the good news that I was hearing. You've got four daughters that even though you're divorced and even though you guys had a crisis of faith and have walked away from the way you were living... They love you. They love spending time with you. They go to festivals with you. you got, one of them out of four is going to have kids soon. You and Shannon can be grandparents. Right. And then you got Shannon. You got a partner that really loves you enough to say like, you know, I think it's a little weird for the way that, you know, it's like you got a lot of love. You clear like one thing. This is a guess. And I don't know you that well. And I don't know Mormonism. I know Mormonism even less. But I know religiosity. Sometimes when the the code goes away that gave all the answers, even though you don't even believe in the code anymore, it's very easy for the feeling like I am, I've got a strategy to, to fall apart. You know, even though you're like, I don't want that strategy. It was, it was a strategy. And now you're more in the like floating chaos zone. And I think, yes. I think that like just being easy on yourself and tell not only, I just realized it. Don't just tell Shannon and your daughter that you're doing your best. You got to tell yourself that you're doing Ooh, your best. Right here. It's true. Yes. I, I, I appreciate that. I mean, this you're, 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 you guys have absolutely 100% nailed this, the situation. And, and I love that. I mean, that's kind of what I've been trying to do is just playing, playing the, the little boy that puts his finger in all the dams and yeah. keep them all. Um, and I just, I am. That's just, exhausting. Yeah. I feel exhausting. like I do that for my life too. And sometimes you just have to like, take a step back and take a breath and do something for yourself. Yeah. You got adult daughters. Your job isn't to fix them anymore. Your job is to love them. And now that you've done, you've done what you can and now you're just there to love them and you're not there to fix Shannon. You're not there to fix your family. You're just there to do your best. One of the sweet things about being Mormon was I did have children very young. Mm. I was in my early twenties. And so now I've got these 20 something year old kids where I'm still young enough to be able to do fun, some fun things with them. So being friends with them is kind of, it's, it's that double edged sword. I don't want to overdo it. I still want to be their father, but it's, we like to go to festivals. We went to a, a, some concerts together and went to Weezer and the Pixies and, and it's just like, this is really fun for us to do together. So I really want to do that too, but it's I'm doing my best. You're doing your best. And I think it's crazy like how lucky it is that your teenage and 20 year old daughters want to go to shows with you. Like there's so many dads out there that kids that age are just like, are you fucking kidding me? I would yeah. never, I would never. So I think you've already been doing your best. You just got to tell yourself. Like I used to say like trying your best is twofold though. It's, it's, you don't just try your, it's not just you're trying your best. Like it, it's not just an excuse. Oh, sorry. I'm doing my best. You also got to do your best. You got to show up, be the best father you can be, the best person, the best partner, the best everything you can be. You got to do both. I can do that. I, and I, I will make mistakes, I'm sure, but I am going to, I'm, I'm committed to it. And, Heck yeah. And, and I want to I see all these people love each other. And well, I want to go on vacations together and, and, I, and I think we'll get there. But uh, I probably just need to be a little bit more patient and, and not try and force something that's not going to happen naturally yeah, it might not ever happen in the way you want it to but it's always going to yeah. happen the way it's supposed to i want our kid to go to weezer with i mean i don't really love weezer but i want to go oh, i like weezer okay anyway i'm trying to go to festivals with my kid when she's 20 that sounds awesome that means you've done something right you guys are the best 
I can't wait to see Natasha December 2nd, even though... Oh, my God. I, I need to call my agent. It's, it's 50-50 those tickets are coming through. But you know what's different about me and Natasha? <laughs> can, I get a, can I get a refund if you don't show up? Yeah, of of co- course. You know what's different about me and Natasha? When I commit to something, I follow through. I, I don't uh, remember this date. <laughs> I, I had tickets to, to see both of you during the pandemic. All right. You don't were, you bring that. How dare you bring that up? Well... That was understandably uh, something that, that couldn't happen. But, uh. I just have to be talked into Utah. Um, it really, the secret here is you all need to go to Burning Man next year, the real Burning Man. You, Shannon, all of yes. uh, your daughters, everybody, and you all need to. I'll meet you. I'll meet you at the uh, the the uh, district, or I'll meet you at oh, uh, yeah. at at um, the Robot Heart, and we'll just we'll bond to get all of us together. And I'll bring that my I'll bring amazing. my my then six year old, and we'll all rave together. It's not going to rain like that two years in a row, right? It's, it's never rained like that ever. before in the last 22 right. years that I've been. Exactly. So I don't think so. Yeah. All right. Well, good all luck. Right. All right, Shane. See Thank you in Utah. You all. Farewell. You're the best. Thanks. Yeah. I like when you can just tell people are nice people. He, well, I mean, Mormons are so nice. That is the thing about you talking shit about them. It's like all religions are kind of crappy and fucked up. Have and you been to Utah? They told me. I love Utah. They told me I couldn't have my shoulders showing at a mall. I'm just saying. They were like, this is a Mormon run mall. You need to cover your shoulders. Anytime you start looking. At and a then room- there was a person with like, a, I kind of finished what happened to sure. me there. There was a person with a laminated um, like necklace on and the lamination had like every person in the Mormon church that they were trying to raise money for. Uh-huh. And it was like 90 white old white men. Yeah. And they're like, please, we need to make money. <gasps> you know who that is? For the-, <laughs> the angel Moroni coming and cursing your nose. Listen, I'm just saying it seemed absurd to me when I was there. All right. If you would like to uh, call us 213-222-8608, leave us a secret. Or you can also email us and say you want to be on the podcast, EndlessHoneymoonPod at gmail.com. And don't forget to join our Patreon. We have... It's an exciting Patreon. Dinner parties coming up. Hey, by the way, I just dropped a new mixtape on the Patreon. This is the best mix I've ever made, I think. Did you listen, Laura? No, she didn't. But you know what? That's fine. It's fine. I don't need anybody to listen. None of the women in my life have to support my hobbies. We will look at your dating profile. We have a whole online community with our Patreon. So make sure to show us support. And also, you can watch all this on youtube natasha you're the best i love your outfit and i love you oh thanks i love you too